So says the Lord, the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. Which is the house that you will build for me and which is the place of my rest? And all these my hand made and all these have become, says the Lord. But to this one will I look, to one poor and of crushed spirit who hastens to do my bidding. Welcome to worship at College Mennonite Church, wherever, whenever, and however you are, you are a part of this blessed worshiping community. Welcome. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. It is in the bulletins, and it will also appear on the screen. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me and the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Please stand and we will join, together, join our voices in worship by singing Voices Together 76, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Before we enter into a time of prayer together, I'm delighted to share with you that Jeff and Jeff Landis and Liz Gundon are the proud grandparents of Finn Jacob Landis. Finn was born on September 15th to his parents Andrew and Ashley Landis. Mom and baby are healthy and doing well, and we hope the same for Andrew. I also want to uh, remind us to remember the um, Alice Lapp and Vi Miller, who are both in hospice care at the Maples and nearing the end of their lives. Please join with me in prayer. Gracious God of the heavens and the earth, of all that is above and below and around, we thank you that we can come before you with all that is on our hearts. You are present and at work in our lives and in the world, and we are grateful. We give you thanks for the safe arrival of Finn, Jacob, and the blessing and joy he is already to his parents, grandparents, and family. We pray for Finn's health, well-being, and rest, and that his parents, Andrew and Ashley, can grab the sleep and sustenance that they need during this high-demand yet joyful time. We thank you, God, for new life, new life that we see in Finn, in David and Sophie's baby, Timothy, in Marie Clement's new grandson, Kaylin, and in many other signs of new life around us. Gracious God, we also name before you those who are ill in body, whether illness is long or painful, difficult to cure, or sudden and unexpected, we trust you to be present with each one. We lift to you Vi Miller and her family as her health is now that she has entered hospice care. Give Vi comfort in body and spirit and comfort her loved ones. We remember Stephen Lang as he undergoes knee replacement surgery tomorrow. We pray that this will go well and his recovery will go even more smoothly than expected. God, in the midst of death and grief, we ask your mercy for those in pain and mourning. We lift to you Alice Lapp and her family. We remember John as they keep vigil and release Alice. Give them your abiding comfort. And again, we ask that you give Alice your peace in body and spirit. We pray also for Jill and Kent Miller, Jared and Addie Lehman and their families dealing with the sudden loss of Jill's brother, Bill. And we lift to you Leonard and Irene Gross as they grieve the loss of Leonard's sister, Miriam Meyer. In all these situations, bring your abiding comfort. Gracious God, we pray for refugees and asylum seekers. We pray for protection and provision in their journeys. We pray that as we welcome people into our lives and our church family, that we embrace our neighbors with the same tenderness and hospitality that we ourselves require. Help us to fulfill your love in this way. God, we carry in our hearts all the peoples of Puerto Rico, 
trying to recover from the devastation of Hurricane Fiona. We remember the peoples of Jackson, Mississippi in need of clean, safe, and reliable drinking water. We hold up to you the peoples of Pakistan as they deal with massive flooding. For all these and many others around this nation and world dealing with struggles of basic survival needs and the need for renewed living spaces, bring your provision, bring encouragement, bring leaders to help carry people through and to care for your aching creation. Gracious God, who will not be contained, you, the one who breaks convention and surprises us with healing, continue to open our eyes that we can continue to partner with you to bring hope and healing to the world. We pray all this and so much more in the name of Jesus. In el nombre de Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn to number 36 in Voices Together. Let us build a house. We will sing verses 1 and 2 as children uh, and families, you're invited to come to the circle. And keep your hymnals open as we will sing verses 4 and 5 following children's time. Hello, my name is Joanne. It's been a really long time since I did children's time, so some of you don't know who I am. Some of you have joined the church since the last time I did children's time. Some of you have been born since the last time I did children's time. So I'm really glad for this chance to do it, but most of the time I have a different job at College Mennonite Church. My job at College Mennonite Church is the worship visuals. Now, for the last two weeks, now this is the third week, we've had these worship visuals up here. Have you noticed them? What does it look like? What do those look like? What do they look like? And there's a Bible passage and? Old pots, cracked pots. Hmm, I think a few people might think that about me. Okay, so this is what, but I bet you everybody's been going, what is this all about? Well, it's about our worship theme for this week. It's about 
the worship visuals are about what God was thinking about what the rulers were doing. Hmm. Now, this is the third Sunday of a new worship series, but this is the first Sunday in which it's gonna come, the theme is going to come into focus. And the theme for this worship series is the fall of the kingdom. When I say fall, everybody's a little squirrely. We're gonna do this. Okay, pay attention. When I say fall, what do you think of? Do you think of the season? Who thinks of the season fall, autumn? Who thinks about falling down? Okay, so I think the worship leaders are having a little fun with us because they want us to think about both of those things. It's fall, and we're gonna talk about the fall of the kingdom. Okay, so today's sermon is about building a house for God, a place for God to meet with his people. Now, I wonder, what kind of house would God want? What, what, what kind of home do you think God wants? What do you think, Zeph? A giant pop-up house. <laughs> a giant pop-up house. Well, I wonder who's anticipating something. Do you think God would want a mansion, big house? Do you think God would want a palace? Something really majestic like Buckingham Palace? No. No. What do you think God would want? I can't hear, can you? An invisible house. Whoa, that's because he's an invisible God. We, yeah, we have to make God visible, don't we? Okay, so we're going to talk. Okay, so um, God. Where am I here? Okay, so God decides that he will let the people have a king when they ask her one. Up till then, God has been their king, and now he's gonna let them have, then he decides he'll let them have a human king as his representative on earth. And the kings want to build him a house. After Solomon builds himself a really gorgeous palace, he decides, hmm, I better build God a really nice temple. And so he does that, but I wonder, does God really want a really big, gorgeous temple? No. God's been living in a tent. He's been meeting, he hasn't been living in a tent. God has been meeting God's people in a tent. People need a place, right? God doesn't need one place, but people need a place, and so God has been meeting people in a tent. Who likes staying in a tent? Yeah, okay, so we're going to put up a tent. Now, before we do this, who knows what a jack-in-the-box is? When you wind it, you have a box, and out pops a jack-in-the-box. Right, so you have to be ready for a big surprise. But this tent is so easy to put up that I'm going to ask the three-year-olds to come help me put this up. That's Micah. Mike has already helped me do this once. Maybe I need a a (laughs) four-year-old. No? Mike, are you going to do this with me? Can you pull this? Mike is going to do it. This is so easy that, oh, as long as it doesn't pop out before we get it, let me help you. Oh, wouldn't you know the zipper would get stuck. You pull it the rest of the way. Okay, now everybody see where these stick tape is, stay behind. Okay, now what, I'll, I'll kinda take it out of the bag. Are you gonna help me some more? Take it out of the bag. Uh-oh, it's coming out, it's coming out. Get back, get back, my guy. Woo-hoo, so that's fun, isn't it? Okay, so I was a little worried that there wouldn't be enough room, I, something's gone wrong here. Won't be enough room in this tent for everybody, but there are not so many children here. But let's start with just the three, the four, and the five-year-old and see if they fit in. The six-year-old, the six-year-old can go in. Does anybody else want to go in? 
Okay, now you're gonna have to sit up, Micah. Okay, be gentle, because this is borrowed. <laughs> okay, okay, so look at everybody's in. That's amazing. Okay, okay, everybody can fit. There's, there's room for enough. Okay, um, so what are the good things about tents? What do we like about tents? They keep out the rain. It's cozy. It's cozy. Yeah, especially with the other people. With the, yeah. You can kind of, you always fit in like sardines, don't you? Okay, what else do we like about tents? What can you do with a tent? Yeah. Okay, um, what you can do with the tent is you can sleep in it. Yeah, you can sleep in it. And do you, just, do you have to buy a place and put it up and leave it there? What, do you, what can you do? Yeah, yeah, you can move it around. Yeah, okay, let's not play with the tent too much, okay, because it is borrowed. Okay, yeah, it moves around. What I like about tents is it's very close to nature, right? And the kind of tents they had in ancient Israel, they could lift up the sides so that they could get a nice breeze so it would keep the sun off, but they'd still be able to see all around and see all nature. Because when you sleep in tents, you hear the crickets, you hear the frogs, you hear the owls. It's lots of fun, and you feel very close to nature, but you feel cozy. And you know what? I think God liked all those things too. Now, yeah, one more thing. Oh, okay, pull it forward. Yeah, because we've got some people are trying to sleep in this tent. Okay, now God's prophets, do you know what prophets are? They're people who bring messages from God. God's prophets wondered if the kings were actually trying to box God in like shove him down into the the jack-in-the-box and box him in, keep him contained. They thought maybe by bringing God the things God needed, they could keep him inside high walls. People would bring gifts to God in God's temple, and maybe if God was so busy accepting people's gifts, he wouldn't notice what the kings were doing outside the temple. Hmm, but do you think God really just wants gifts? What does God want? Nature. Pardon? Nature. Nature, he likes nature. God likes nature. 10% of your week's profit. Yeah, 10% of your week's profit. Tithing. Okay, Uh, no, try not to lean so much. Okay, what else does God like? What does God want? from us. Payment. Payment. To be paid. To be paid? Hmm, I think we need to address the Sunday school (laughs) curriculum here. What does God want? God, okay, God wants all of that, but what does he want us to do? Worship Worship him and? He wants us to share. He wants us to be good, right? He wants a hug. He wants wants us to make room for everybody in the tent, right? So it's a good thing today we have a small group so everybody could fit in the tent, right? Okay, but I think you guys all know what God really wants. So on with, oh, Micah, one more thing. Yes, all the people can go in or some of the people can go in. So I think we're going to get out of the tent now. Yeah, and then we're going to try and put it back into the bag. Okay. (laughs) Okay, away we go. Out we go. Max just wants to stay in God's house forever. I think there's a psalm about that. Okay, out we go, Max. (laughs) I think, Max, out we go. We're going to put it together outside. Uh, Okay, we're going to do it outside, okay?
The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us greet each other with a sign of Christ's peace. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Kings with selections from chapter 6 and 8. In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. The house that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The house was built with stone finished at the quarry, so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the temple while it was being built. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes, obey my ordinances, and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will establish my promise with you, which I made to your father David. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the Ark. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, You promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying that there shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? 
Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Have regard to your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may, not, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. The word of the Lord. Our preacher this morning is Anne Graber Hirschberger. Anne is the executive director of MCCUS, and she lives in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And we are grateful that Anne is able to be here this weekend. She's here in town for the relief sale and maybe some, some meetings associated with that. Welcome, Anne. Um, let's pray for Anne and for us. Gracious God, we thank you for Anne's uh, presence in our community this day. We thank you for your calling upon her life and the gifts that she shares with us. Open our hearts to receive your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is so good to be here with you this morning. I have been in this space, uh, but not, I don't think, for a Sunday morning worship. And as I've seen, uh, met people and seen people are looking at people here, I realize that I am among not only family, some cousins, uh, friends from my 30-some years at Eastern Mennonite University teaching there, uh, co-MCCers, uh, uh, as, as well as um, um, folks that i actually f visiting from my home in Virginia, if you want to wave over there. So it, I, feel, I feel at home. My husband Jim and I served for uh, 10 years in Central America, uh, the first three with Rosedale Mennonite Missions, and then later in El Salvador and Nicaragua with, with MCC which deeply shaped my life. Times of violence and war, and uh, that, that ends up shaping you a great deal. Another note of connection with this congregation is that um, in May, I was in John and Sandra Lapp's home in Cairo and felt welcomed there and understood even then that uh, this vigil was for his, his mother would, would be occurring sometime. I understand that, uh, for, and, and, for, and Joanne mentioned this, that you're in this third week of this series. The image of singing God's song in a strange land and the whole exile uh, story is very rich and offers opportunities for reflection, both in the Old Testament stories and the, discerning the message for our times. I must say that uh, when I first heard what the scripture was for this morning, I was trying to figure out how I'm gonna connect that with an MCC, but I have always enjoyed the challenge of taking the lectionary scriptures and saying, what does God have to say to us through these combinations of scriptures? So it feels a bit the same. You know, the basic truth has not changed. God has covenanted with us, not only as our creator and our shepherd and our loving parent, but also as our leader. We are clawed, called to declare allegiance and witness to the God of love and justice. And we are always in danger of turning away to follow other gods and become like those who are dedicated to those gods then there are consequences for those actions, and yet always God is faithful in love and graciously and tenaciously calls us back. We stand in that line of history. In the scripture for today, we hear the story of Solomon building and dedicating the temple in Jerusalem. This is 480 years, 12 generations of 40 years each after leaving Egypt. And as you heard, the temple construction took seven years. 
The scripture that was read today, the scripture that's at the top of the bulletin is, is longer than the scripture was read, and the scripture that was, that's at the top of the bulletin is just a fraction of the, the verses and chapters in many books about the temple. Solomon uses the finest of building, temp, building materials, cedars from Lebanon, cypress, wood, gold, silver, bronze, huge blocks of cut and dressed stone. He has master craftsmen carve into the walls of the temple elaborate decorations of cherubim, a word we've heard several times this morning, palm trees and flowers, and then he overlays everything with gold. It's magnificent inside and out. Chapter six describes the blueprint and some of the reasons for the architectural decisions. Such great care is given, such respect for the place created for the name of God. Then God speaks, 12 in, in chapter six, 12 and 13. If you will walk in my statutes and my ordinances, I will establish my promise that I made to your father David, I will dwell among the children of Israel and not forsake you. Notice he didn't promise to dwell in the temple, he promised to dwell with the people. There's continuity here from the beginning of time. People have always created altars, and then people, and then the children of Israel created the tabernacle, also elaborately uh, defined and, and prescribed. This is from the time of Abraham and Sarah to, to the times of, of this temple building. By the time of Solomon, those wandering people are settled. They're not nomads anymore, and there's a significant shift in their worldview. They're established in the land that God promised to Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. They are now a prosperous nation, with a glorious and wise king. Remember how admired he was, and by extension, the nation. They can bask, kind of like I think many of us bask in the, um, the new music group, the Lichty group. Everybody's basking in that. It's a little bit like that. It was not long after Solomon began his reign that he began building what his father David had, had planned but was not allowed to build this temple. And as Joanne mentioned, he also took 13 years to build himself a house and one for one of his wives uh, that was similar to, the, to his house, uh, happened to be a Pharaoh's daughter. And a side note that wasn't in our scripture this morning, in previous chapters, we're told that this work was done with forced labor of 30,000 people. Forced labor of 30, thousand people and thousands of paid laborers. Then we come to chapter eight, the dedication. I can't quite imagine the hugeness of that celebration. It's definitely dwarfed the relief sale. All of Israel came. The Ark of the Covenant was brought from the place where David had set, it up, set up for it and placed in the holy place and the glory of, of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And then Solomon ex exclaims, but we can't contain you, God. We can't contain you. He also then asks to, for God to remember that there is sin, and please, will God continue to forgive? There's a great deal of irony here. Such care was taken to build the temple even when Solomon recognizes that God will not be contained there. He recognized that God has said of the temple that my name will be there, not that God would dwell there, and yet needs to have this focus for the, where the prayers, he prays for the, may God listen to the prayers of the people in this place, wherever God dwells. God's infinite nature cannot be contained by the finite. Solomon recognizes this. And in, in the similar passage in Second Chronicles, he added, who am I? to build a temple for God, except for a place to offer sacrifices. What can we take away from these passages for our own time, thousands of years later? Let's consider three possibilities. We are human, and we need place. We need places to worship God. 
We need places to worship together. This doesn't discount how individuals need to find space for worship, where that, wherever that might be for each of us. That has always been true. I'm always renewed spiritually by going several times a year camping in a tent in the Shenandoah National Park, just, just a few feet away from the Appalachian Trail. But gathered worship is extremely important. Singing, me singing alone is not like the music we had here. Shared prayers, hearing the scripture read in the body and renewing our faith together and acting out of that faith to share God's love and compassion strengthen each of us. In the last year, I've had the opportunity to visit many communities where MCC partners carry out the ministry of the church and have been moved by the power in such places and gatherings. In May, I was in a gathering of MCC East, uh, Middle East leaders in a retreat center that was built by the Egyptian Coptic Church, a place called Anafora, which some of you may have visited. It is truly an oasis in the desert. Egyptian Christians live in a precarious relationship with the majority religion and have been, been besieged and attacked throughout the last decades. And part of the pressure comes from misinformation that children are taught in school about the origins of Christianity. Bishop Thomas envisioned a place where the Coptic Christians could gather and be renewed. The rhythm of nightly ves vespers in that place by candlelight was so centering every night that week. Over the past 25 years, that retreat center has expanded to education and ministry. Scores of children and youth and adults come to learn to remember who and whose they are and to embed the story of God's work and God's people deep into their being. There's a replica of the temple, a replica of the ark. Um, it's a place that is seen as a safe place to talk about who they are. I'm reminded of the, Paul's admonition in Hebrews to not neglect, neglect meeting together, but encourage one another. MCC partners with Anaphora to carry out and expand that ministry with those who have experienced violence and abuse. As we gather in our spaces, we learn about the needs of those around us, as well as remembering who we are and worshiping the God who loves all of us. One of the more joyful worship services that I, that I have been at for some years was last December in Kitwit in, in the DRC in Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. The Kitwit Mennonite Brethren Church started well over 100 years ago before MCC started. I'd been traveling in Congo for several weeks throughout this vast country the size of Western Europe, visiting MCC partners and programs. The MB Church is a longtime partner, focusing now mostly on thousands of persons from Eastern DRC that have been displaced by horrific violence. After listening to stories of suffering and learning about projects such as income generation, food supplements, education, and peace building, it was moving to worship together. This worship was both long-term residents and displaced persons who have found home, physical and spiritual, through this congregation. There are challenges to be sure, as I think you've experienced as a congregation, but Sunday is a time to come together to worship God and experience the joy of the Spirit. Second, that we have a temptation to acculturate, always, to forget who we are and who God is. Walter Brueggemann uses the terms totalism as versus testimony in describing this tension. Totalism is the dominance of empire from ancient times to the empire where we live today. The massive power of empire creates an all-encompassing presence, leaving no segment of human society in the shadows. Governance, economic system, arts, social structures, education, re religion, entertainment brightly reflect the glowing light of the preeminence of empire. Empires aren't interested in developing a flourishing human society. Empires are interested in maintaining power. By contrast, testimony is the work of prophets to name and change totalism. 
Solomon's building of the temple was a mixture of these two. We heard it. We heard Joanne talk about it. Solomon recognizes who God is and what God requires, but cannot escape the power of empire within himself and around himself. Remember the forced labor? Remember his prayers for staying in power? Today, the task of the church is to be a faithful witness, a testimony to an imagination shaped by the biblical narrative. Empires work hard to silence alternative voices. We experienced that when, when Michael Sharp was killed not many years ago. The church gathers as a body to witness to the subversive words from God's word and resist the empire. All of us are prone to the same tension. Even MCC is prone to that tension because as denominations, uh, we are pr as prone to this MCC as, as are denominations and local churches. Our identity statement reads, a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist churches sharing God's love and compassion for all in the name of Christ and working by responding to basic human needs and working for peace and justice. However, as a relief and development agency working alongside many secular agencies we always need to remind ourselves of who we are and how we are different. But in the broader church, I see testimony at work in ways that respond. Relief sales, thrift stores, donations, offering time to help others. This model is a testimony, a testimony. Finally, God cannot be contained in a temple or any of our structures, but God is with us. In Luke, some of Jesus' disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, eh, what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be on another. Living after Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice, we are not building a temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us. Or to put it another way, we are the body of Christ, as Paul tells us as well. God doesn't live in buildings, but lives in us and in this gathered being, body. The temple is a sign and means that, of that communication with God and deserves to be remembered with honor. This text gives us the opportunity to remember our ancestors in faith and to give thanks for the mercy of God that includes us too. The response hymn that we will sing takes us to a place of recognition that the church buildings we have do not contain God, but it is God dwelling in his people. Yet we become a body that lives. We remember and speak again. We give testimony to what we have heard, God's free redeeming word. Thanks be to God. And that song of affirmation is number 22 in Voices Together, What is This Place? And I invite you to stand in body or spirit. <laughs>
We continue in worship by sharing our tithes and offerings, and our offertory this morning will be sung as a congregational song, There's Enough for All, which is Voices Together 757. Sing that song. When we get through the second time through, please join Malachi's tin whistle with your whistles. So we're going to not sing the second time through, we're going to whistle it all the way through. And the third time through, we'll go back to singing. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have created each one of us and given us the breath of life. You sent your son, Jesus, to us to make us one with you. Bind us to you and to the poor and crushed in spirit. Lighten our path as we follow Jesus. Bless these gifts we return to you as a sign of our gratitude. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Invite you to turn to our hymn of response, and I don't have a bulletin with me. It's number 11, the voices together. I invite you to stand.
receive this blessing. Leave this place with the knowledge of God's abiding presence. Go in peace. Amen.